video. It's actually nice. Just sorry, this is off. I haven't got this written down, so you know this is going to be a long sermon uh, when I do this. Uh, but you know, I'm sitting down there, I'm worshiping, and I get up, and then I do my sermon, and I stop, and I look. I look into your beautiful smiley faces. <laughs> They're all very blue this morning. It's fantastic. Hey, this morning, uh, or actually this week, the world was awakened, wasn't it, to this ongoing conflict uh, between Russia and U Ukraine. I say ongoing because. We might have heard about it this week, but uh, those two countries in particular have been hearing about it for a very, very long, long time. We heard about it when President Putin decided to move his troops not just up to the border, but across the border and into the city of Kiev. And so our hearts go out to the people of Russia and to the people of Ukraine. It's actually really hard to understand what's going on. And, and, and actually this week I got a little bit infuriated too, you know, like, uh, because, because media throws a whole lot of stuff at us and we so readily pick it up and believe it. But I want to tell you something, and this is the truth, they're spinning you what they know you'll read and what you'll click next on. That's all they care about. Get a next, get a like, get a thing, and their ratings go up, their papers sell, their newspaper articles. It's hard to tell the truth from the side of things. In fact, there's actually really, we've, we've been told, haven't we, that there's three sides to truth. There's your side, there's my side, and there's God's side. But the real fact of that is there's only one side who understands what's really going on. And that's our God that we worship here today. He truly understands what's happening, and I'm sure his heart is breaking for both countries. I got, as I said, I got infuriated. <laughs> and it's silly, because on Facebook, and it's stupid Facebook, right? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, if it wasn't for being a minister, I would have deleted that thing a long time ago. We use it as one of the things to navigate and communicate with, but oh man. But the amount of Ukraine flags that people decide to chuck up, chuck up. I, I got angry because I was like, there's two sides to this. And, and two sides of innocent parties. And I thought, oh, you know what, I said to Sarah, I, I want to feel like I just chuck up a Russian flag. And Sarah said, don't do that because I tell you what, <laughs> you're about to get hammered. And I, so I didn't. But it just, you know, it's really hard in these days to know what is real and what's being spun to us. And so I ask you as a church congregation, as a Christian church congregation, pray for all involved. Pray for those that are doing wrong. Pray for those uh, who are helpless and victims. Pray for those who are just trying to defend their houses and their homes and their families. Pray for everybody and ask that God's will uh, and peace and protection would come upon that. As I said, you know, one thing is clear out of all of this when I watch the media and when I listen, and it's the vulnerable and the defenceless on both sides of that border that are, that are being harmed and affected. Their lives, they're the ones that are suffering the most. I can't imagine the nerves that they would be feeling. Families across the world who can't get back because of COVID and, or can't get away because of COVID. You know, like it's, it's hard to imagine the nerves, the extreme tension that these innocent people are, f are under. It's really frightening to think about when we stop and pause. Pictures have been all over the news and Facebook and everything else of people being huddled in makeshift bomb shelters fleeing, trying to leave the city and being stuck in traffic jams and people protesting and being uh, in Russia and being arrested because they're not allowed to have their opinion. When in my country, we just park up a tent on the parliament lawns and grow a herb garden. <laughs> Seriously, New Zealand. It's COVID, put a mask on. <laughs> there are bigger things to be at, you know, fighting these days. We were very glad to hear during this week when we made contact, Major uh, Elizabeth Garland, is, as Sarah said, is, uh, is doing well. She worshipped with us here in 2019 and 2020, and uh, Sarah and I were in a Bible study with her and a few others, and, and it was a really nice uh, time to have Dr. Elizabeth Garland, I should say. 
Dr. Major Elizabeth. Major, doctor. <laughs> she's a bright lady. And uh, she's currently serving in Moldova. And that's just a small country. And I, I kind of want to, when we think about overseas and we think about how hard, it's hard to imagine how close Moldova is to Kiev. Well, it's 500 k's away. Where's 500 k's from Adelaide? Mount Gambia. There you go. That's how close she is to all this that's going on. And there are millions of people in between her and Kiev as well. And But she's doing okay. She's cautiously watching the situation as as all army officers and, and other people are doing. And, and, uh, and so we just keep her in our prayers. When I think about all of these people that are involved in this situation, I think about the people in Queensland and, and even in my own country, as Sarah said, with COVID numbers going through the roof. I can't imagine how desperate they would, they would be to uh, feel peace and rest. To hear the silence from bombs dropping and the quiet due to no more gunfire or the peace across their country due to no more tears and suffering. Just to experience that rest. That silence like we just had then. You know, rest is a rare commodity in these days. It's a very rare thing. William Shakespeare, uh, you know who he is? Yeah, good, good. He actually said um, that there is plenty of time to rest when you're dead. You ever read his work? <laughs> I haven't got time to rest when I'm dead. Because I'm going to be worshipping. I'm going to be more tired singing songs that I don't like to sing, thank you God. I'm talking to him about that. I'm not a big singer. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I won't be getting Soul Factor invite, I get it. There was somebody who else said a quote during this week that we should uh, rest when we retire. Yep. <laughs> I looked at someone's calendar a few, oh, it might have been a month ago or so ago, and I was trying to get a visit with them. And I, I looked, I said, you guys are busier than I am. Admittedly, most of it was doctor's appointments and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, let's arrange it. It was ridiculous, seriously. You know, Webster's Dictionary of 1828, it actually defines rest as the ceasing of, from action and the motion of any kind. It is to stop. When was the last time you stopped? Actively, intentionally stopped. Not just stopped because you'd finished all your tasks and, 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 you'd, and, uh, and, and all the other things that you had to do and you thought, ah, oh, I can just sit back and watch the cricket now. But actually, actively, intentionally chose to go, you know what, I'm gonna stop. When was the last time you did that? Stop doing, stopped overthinking, stopped worrying. Maybe that's why you come to church today and every week. Maybe it gives you a chance to stop. Jesus said to us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, in his in that first book of the Gospels, he said that those who are weary and heavy burdened should come to him and he will give you rest. We find rest in Christ when we come to him. Those who are weary and heavy burdened. But you see, we don't just need rest when we're weary or heavy burdened or when we're in conflict or when we feel like we've got the weight of the world on our shoulders. All of that is actually a sign that you are overdue for rest. It's like dehydration. I was with Richard uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was, and he taught me a valuable lesson. I had a headache and I was thirsty and, you know, I was you know, hanging out for water and I got to the top of Norton's Hill biking and, and I knocked back about three quarters and he told me off. 
And I, I know when Richard tells you off, it's either because you moved his hammer or because <laughs> you haven't drunk enough water on your bike. You know, like he was dead serious and he was right. He said, you are thir when you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. It's too late. So do it often. When you're tired, when you're worried, when you're exhausted, when you need, feel like you need to stop. It's too late. You should have put it in practice and actively and intentionally just stopped. We're told in Scripture that we need rest regularly. In the book of Exodus, God actually gives Moses the Ten Commandments. He's up on Sinai, which I'm sure he would have desired, desired to have a stop when he got to the top of that big hill. And, he, and God wrote to him on, the ta on these stone tablets and he said, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It was one of the Ten Commandments, the laws that these Israelites were to keep. Sabbath meaning rest. You are to rest. Work for six and rest on the seventh. We're instructed to have it regularly. Why? Not just for our physical well-being, but actually because it keeps us in check with God. Remember. Gives us a chance to remember, Brian, absolutely. Keeps us in check with him. It reminds us who we are. It helps us to live holy lives. I know when I get tired and I get exhausted, I get stupid. I get anything but holy. And yet God calls me to be holy. So what do I need to do? I need to rest. You know, when we obey this simple practice of stopping and resting, it's not also just about us. It's also about others. Because plenty of people were looking these days, plenty of people were watching and seeing how are we behaving? How are we living any different to anyone else? And when we actively choose to rest, we send a massive message to them that it's important. That we are not all powerful. But we worship a God who is. And so we need to get it in our heads and our hearts that proper rest plays a significant role in our salvation. Not just for eternity, like William Shakespeare would want it to be, but actually for our now. To rest. It's not a sign of weakness to stop. It's actually a sign of obedience. In John 10, 10, Jesus tells a group of Pharisees and other onlookers that he's uh, come to give his followers life. That those who will follow him, he wants to give them life and life in all of its abundance. You know, you can't have that life and life in all of its abundance when you're tired. In fact, sometimes you feel like anything but that. And the only reason is, that, is because we didn't actually listen to Jesus in the first place when he said, rest, stop. Work for six, rest on the seventh. Jesus knew that this simple command to rest was crucial to our discipleship with him. Crucial to us being his followers. And it's crucial to our effectiveness in actually sharing the gospel, both in word and in deed. That's why in Mark 6, 31, 40 to 44, which we read a few verses of before, Jesus takes his disciples aside and he says, come away with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. See, for these disciples, it had been a really busy time. He had sent them. Actually, the word, is, the word in the scriptures here is apostles. For the first time, we start to see the word apostles. It's because Jesus had sent them on their little mission to do a whole lot of preaching and a whole lot of healing and a lot of, they did a big circuit, you know, around the towns. And they came back excited and enthusiastic for all that they had accomplished and done. 
They're bubbly. Look what we've done. We're changing the world, Jesus. It's exciting. And Jesus stops them right there and he says, come away with me by yourself to a quiet place and I'll give you rest. You know, from a leadership perspective, this is a real buzzkill. When you get momentum, any leader will tell you, when you get momentum, you keep that baby rolling because to try and get that wheel going again is incredibly hard. And so you do everything and anything possible to keep that working. I've read hundreds of books. Well, no, I haven't read hundreds of books. I've read hundreds of words in books. <laughs> that said that. You can see I've gone away from my notes. But it's, it's absolute garbage. Because all it tells you is that you are in control. You are supreme. You are all sufficient. And it's all relying and resting on you. And that's why you've got to do everything possible to keep the momentum happening. And Jesus says to these guys, and this is Jesus. It's not the disciples. He himself is putting this into practice. The Son of God. And he is saying, come away with me and get some rest. I need it. And if I need it, you need it. Follow my practice. And so he gives them these four simple instructions. To come away, he says. Come with me, he says. It's an intentional decision to follow him. To put our priorities aside and allow our hearts and minds to align with his ways and thoughts. We go away with him knowing that it's his will we want. That he provides the nourishment for our souls. Not whether we've ticked the next box or um, achieved the next goal. But it is God who provides the nourishment for our souls. Number two, he says, by yourself, he says. He says in scripture, leave your iPhones, leave your iPads, leave your iMacs and iBooks and every other i thing that you might have, leave it aside. He doesn't say that quite in scripture, but that's what he's getting at for the modern day version. He said, come away with him by yourself without distraction. I want to be honest, how many of you right in this church service have checked your Facebook page? Have checked your emails or a text message. You know? When he says, come away with me without distraction, he literally means it. And it's really tough in these days of instant communication and wanting to know what's going on now and then. To just be with him in that moment. To not worry about that latest Facebook post or the phone call that happened and I should have answered it or that text message or that idle chit chat that went on or that piece of gossip that now I'm going to really miss out I'm going to have to hear it from about five people, other people just to hear what was originally said and actually give them some dedicated space and time. My wife will love this one. He wants some quality time with just you and him. Sarah always asks me for quality time and I still say to her, I have no idea what quality time means. And I'm partly wondering if that actually has an impact on my relationship with Christ as well. Come away with him by yourself, he says, to a quiet place. You know, the Bible dictionary translates this word quiet as a solitary place, a place where you can be alone. If you live alone, this is easier, you know, you're alone. Just don't answer the phone, leave off the TV. If you've got kids at home, a husband or a wife, maybe a busy social life, a public job, then this can be incredibly hard to find this solitary place. The disciples had an incredibly public life and so that's why he wanted to go across the lake and go to a lonely, a quiet, solitary place with them. 
Get away from the preaching circuits, the crowds, and find a tree all by yourself and sit there. They needed a clear place to clear their heads, to clear their hearts and their minds and, and refocus on God. Gets deeper yet. The word quiet place is also the same Greek word as Jesus uses in the wilderness. When Jesus was baptised, where did he go? He went off to the wilderness. He went off to a quiet place, a solitary place. We usually link this in with the fact that he went off there to be tempted. He didn't go there to be tempted. When he was there, he was tempted. He went there to pause, to stop, to think and reflect and remember, what is it that God has just said to me? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so we come away with him to a quiet place by ourselves to reflect and to remember whose we are, who we are and whose we are. That actually nothing that we had to do or have done in the past has any reflection on the fact that actually you are God's child and you are loved. Whether you know it or not, he looks down on you right now and he says, this is my child and I love you. And it has absolutely nothing to do with any degrees or certificates or work history or, or anything that you might think that you might accomplish in the future. It is because who you are and you are his. We are human beings. We are made in God's image. We're not human doings. God loves us and he calls us and tells us that we are his own before we did anything. We find this space in our heads and our hearts. When we find this space, when we find this quiet space, it doesn't have to be a physical space, but when we find this space of just being alone with God in our heads and our hearts, remembering whose we are, then we've entered into our quiet place. And the fourth thing is that he says, get some rest. This is about knowing that we have God given limits for a reason. He is God. He is the creator, the preserver and the governor of all things. Not you, not me. He is. It is God who restores us and gives us rest. It is God who has given us physical, mental and spiritual limits and needs for a reason. It's because he wants us to trust him and rely on him. You know, when we're able to do this, to come away with him by ourselves to a quiet place and get some rest, like he instructed his disciples, we'll find that we free ourselves from this addiction or this compulsion that we have to hurry and rush being reactive all the time and making these split decisions and actually stop. We allow God's will to unfold. We honour God. We really honour God by choosing to move at His pace, in His rhythms of grace, rather than and being able to delight in Him in this moment, rather than simply trying to force our way ahead as the kids try to burst through here and so I have a challenge for you this week is that you find some rest find some space to have a rest get away with Jesus just by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest and then when you're done Find someone to tell. Share it with a loved one, a friend, a stranger, a person sitting at a cafe as we have doorways, whatever it might be. Find someone 
to tell of your experience with Christ and what that rest meant. Even if it simply is, you know what? I just stopped for five minutes today and I rested with God. And it was good. Share it with someone. Because in doing that actually encourages that that's okay to stop and rest. We're so quick to tell each other that actually what we accomplished and what we did and how we worked and what we achieved, but when was the last time we told someone we stopped and rested? When we actually obeyed his commandments. You know, I don't know what it is for you this week to stop and rest. Maybe, here's some ideas, maybe it's sitting under a favourite tree. There's one just out here in Rymel Park with a beautiful bench on it, underneath it. There's a, a, maybe it's taking a walk on the beach perhaps or having a good cup of coffee or tea with your scriptures out uh, in the sun on your phone or even on, in your Bible. Maybe it's having some unhurried time with your children or grandchildren or your spouse and you're just enjoying that moment with God and all the treasures that he's given you. Whatever it is, I encourage you to find some rest and be intentional about it this week. Practice being in his presence. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Everyone knows what Ash Wednesday is? Ash Wednesday is the day that we uh, start Lent. And uh, it's 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter. And it starts our preparation time where we pause and think and remember all that he went through and suffered on the cross. And wouldn't it be a good way to start Ash Wednesday, to start Lent this year, to do our own sacrifice in the sense of actually stopping and resting, sacrificing from the need of wanting to crave, the cravings of having to do something, to pausing from all the busyness and the hurry that's in our lives, to put our cell phones aside and just have some quiet space with God and remember those in the Ukraine and Russia. You know, we're going to listen to a song now that's sung um, by Beck and Sarah, a duet. And it's going to be accompanied, I was told it was going to be accompanied by Lockie on the guitar. Oh, and Andrew on the bass. No, not Andrew on the bass. But as these guys sing this song, it's entitled Sweet Hour of Prayer. And as they sing this, I want to invite you, I want to create some space to just rest, to breathe. Think about the air that's going in and out and whose you are and where you're sitting. Not what you've got to do in the roast that's burning, but actually just pausing in this moment and resting. Let go of your concerns of what must happen next and your worries about the unsolved problems. And for these next three minutes or so, listen, relax, and trust God as he continues to speak uh, into your life.